I'm Jane Trigere and we are at the Deerfield Arts Bank and this is Talking Art. Our guest today is Rachel Hankinson. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. So Rachel, uh, I've noticed that I have seen a theme that's going on here. I seem to be getting a lot of people with British accents. Really? Yes. And um, can you, would you be willing to tell us where you come from and why you are happen to be in this oh, region of the United right. States? <clears throat> well, at my age, of course, it's a long story, but I'll keep it short. <laughs> so um, I came to America initially in the 60s. I met a, a really a very nice gentleman who was studying at Oxford, who was an American. And you were from and England. I, I was living in England. I had grown up in England, and um, I was um, actually living in uh, Oxfordshire, and he was studying at Oxford. We met at a dance, and um, a couple of years later, anyway, uh, I was, we got married, uh, and I came to live in the United States, and that was in 1961, that was a long time ago. Um, I stayed over here for about 20 years, and then I went back to live in England with my two daughters. I was divorced by that time, and um, um, I stayed in England for quite a long time, uh, over 20 years, uh, and then I came back here after my mother passed away, and because my children were Americans and they were living over here, and I wanted to have more contact with my family. So that's really the story. It's not an uncommon story. No, no. No, I mean, even in, in this region as well. Yes. We meet a lot of people who've come because their children are here. Yes. And, uh, you know, I had an ac the academic connections. So um, here I am in a very academic area again. What were the academic connections? Well, my husband was a professor uh, eventually, and um, so uh, we lived in Ithaca at one point, and uh, that's where I got my bachelor's in fine art. Um, well, that was uh, my next question. Did you study art? Yes, there we I go. did. I did. I, uh, I was very torn. I had this um, great interest in what I called helping people. Um, and uh, my grandmother had told me that I was a good listener. She thought I would make a good social worker. Um, although I was much more interested in the arts, I thought, at that time. But later on, um, as I started out in college, which, which was in California, um, at Mills, um, I suddenly realized how much I loved art. So um, I was starting to have my children at that point. And um, I could combine doing part-time art courses with taking care of children. Um, and eventually, I did get my degree in fine art. But it was 10 years after I started, so it took me a long time. Fair enough. Yes. Fair enough. You were doing double duty. Yes, I was. I was, very much so. And what did you focus on in your studies? Um, well, once I had decided I was going to be in art, um, I had a sideline of art history, which I really love. I was absolutely fascinated by how art had evolved over, um, over many, many periods of time, and also how it was different in different cultures. Um, and, um, but I, I struggled with where I was going initially in art. I was very interested in the figure, and I did a lot of figurative work. Um, and. Um, I was, in, I, I was very interested in color, and I explored color in, in its subtleties, um, using sort of grays, different tones of grays for some of my paintings. Um, and, uh, but then I became very involved with the feminist movement, and I started to um, object to certain things which I saw as very masculine, which was like hard-edged paintings, you know, in a frame, square frame. Why do you think of that as... Masculine. Well, because um, when you're learning, um, when you're a student, very often you're making your own frames. And I actually went and took a course at uh, Cornell in the Agricultural College, um, cement and woodwork on the farm, so I could actually learn how to do better woodworking and make my frames. Um, but um, I discovered that I was actually scared of bandsaws, these things that go round very fast. You know? <laughs> And I was, I was kind of like very slow in making anything. So I decided that maybe, maybe the, this wasn't an avenue that I should be pursuing. Um, I loved uh, the softer arts that I had learned from my, in my family, uh, sewing and knitting and um, 
um, you know, these kinds of crafts and that sort of thing, which I really loved, why not combine that with, um, with my art? So I, I, I started to abandon the idea of using um, a, a square canvas, a square piece of paper or whatever, and um, used fabrics and different shapes of fabrics, joined things with threads and so on, and tried to create a more three-dimensional kinds of work that related perhaps to craftsmanship, um, which women had always excelled at and been valued for. So it was a, it was a it was a way of expressing my um, my ad admiration for these qualities in my family and in myself. So you get your BFA from Cornell. Yes. And you don't continue. You end up going mm. to social work. Yes, I. This was uh, something that. Um, my feminist friends thought I was abandoning the cause because of some of my art I was trying to express my concern about women's issues. But uh, I had been in therapy for a while and uh, began to be very interested in the process of therapy. So the quickest way to become a therapist at that time was to get a degree in social work. So I was able to, to do that and, um, and I needed to, to have a have a job, basically, because I was a single parent. Um, and, and art just doesn't do it. Well, I, I could have been a teacher, but I didn't want to be a teacher. Um, so, you know, that was my solution. Right. Fair that enough. That was my solution, right. yeah. So, um, but you did say here that you were working as a batik artist while you were a social worker. Yes, Tell I... Tell us about that. I, that's For instance, what you're wearing right now. Yeah, this is a piece that I made many years ago. Um, and it's a very free kind of way of working with batik. Uh, there's just little splodges of wax here and there and the colors dripped on and so on. Um, and it's on silk. Um, uh, but I, um, I really fell in love with batik. I was working as a social worker. I was also running uh, quite a lot of therapy groups um, and I used very different art techniques to help people um, express themselves and uh, feel normal you know, be in touch with that normal desire to create. Um, so uh, I did try batik with people and they enjoyed it and I realized I loved it and I wanted to do it. <laughs> I wanted to do it a lot. So um, I'd pop over to the, um, to the center where we had this, this equipment in the, at the weekend and borrow it and started uh -huh. making batik fabrics. And then I loved to sew, I started making them into clothing. So I had this first outfit that I made, I just absolutely loved. It was a skirt and a blouse made with um, this batik fabric. Do you still have it? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if it survived that long. But I have a lot of other pieces that I made. I did a lot of clothing. Eventually when I decided to stop the social work as a full-time job, although I had to continue part-time to keep the money flowing, um, I, I, I advertised myself as making batik clothing and furnishings and uh, I would um, take commissions from people who wanted to have an outfit made for them that perhaps was for a special occasion like a, uh, one of their children's weddings or something like that and create this one, this piece that would be one of a kind um, in batik and uh, that was great fun but of course I didn't really make that much money at it. Um, and I did it mainly with people that I knew who were friends. And in fact, people in the town would say, oh, you've got to get done by Rachel, which would mean get a batik outfit made by her. <laughs> but anyway, eventually, uh, that's, you know, that was something that I was moving on from. Um, and um, I started to get this interest in um, meditation and so, so that led to a journey to India. But by then I was already um, in a situation where I was partly retired and could afford to be a bit freer with my time. So I think that probably takes us to this mm -hmm. and this and the other, yes, the other things, right, pieces here. Yes. Would you like to, some of them are on fabric Yes. and they are not batik, this is painted. Yes. And others are, frankly, you know, is that a, 
is is that uh, warrior person on top of the yes. ox? Is that a, a painting? It's a painting, yes. It's uh, painted with gouache paint. Uh, and um, it's a depiction of Sri Durga, who is fighting a demon who's um, a shapeshifter. He can turn himself into animals. And when he was a buffalo, uh, that's when she managed to kill him. And she was actually, um, it, the story is, and this is a Hindu myth, that um, uh, the, 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 this demon was attacking um, the gods, the Hindu gods. and. Um, they all came together and gave all their weapons to this female that they created who would be the one to defend them. And she was the one that went into battle with this demon because they could not defeat this demon. And she was the one that was finally able to destroy him when he was in this shape of a, of a buffalo. So here I have her with a sword and a, um, a spear. She's and a trident, actually. She's, um, she usually is depicted with many, many arms. In this one, I just have her with two arms. So you were deeply infused in the Hindu stories. The Hindu to stories, be able to, to, yes. To do this kind of detail work. The yeah? Hindu stories, I've loved stories. I've always loved stories. I was a great reader as a kid, and later on, you know, I read a lot, and I enjoyed mythology and so on. and. Uh, in being involved in this meditation, Sahaja Yoga meditation, um, the guru, Sri Mataji, told us many stories about the deities, these Hindu deities, in order to illustrate a particular point about meditation. So in this particular situation, this woman, this courageous woman, by herself, destroying the worst kind of evil, was a, was a lesson. It was a lesson in understanding that um, women were very powerful. It was also um, a lesson in how courage is within us personally. It's always there, but we have to access it. And I painted that when I was actually aware of how uncourageous I was being at a particular point in time. And I wanted to access this courage in myself. Oh, how wonderful. So oh, wonderful. these um, miniature paintings are all, to some extent, about these kind of issues that are, that are either affecting me personally or sometimes, um, in, a, in a, a greater sense, more socially. Um, the one here on the right of... Now that seems like a miniature to me. The one we've that, been talking yes. about doesn't feel like a miniature. This is a fusion of miniature painting and Western art. It's taking some of my experience as a figurative painter. Uh -huh. Normally it would have been smaller. Um, yes, they are small often, but they're not always. It's the style. It's the style. style. Mm -hmm. The so, style. So tell us about this one, which seems to have some a repeat pattern. That's of, right. Can you tell me about that? Okay. Um, it, the reason that there's a pattern there that's repeated is because of the story involved. This is a depiction of um, Sri Krishna, who um, was a god who... He was a black god. He's also uh, sometimes seen as the energy of the United States, which is very interesting to combine. By whom? By uh, s the people who are aware of Sahaja Yoga and the subtle meaning of some of these uh -huh. things. Each country has a different deity oh. that represents them. So um, it, the United States has um, Sri Krishna, who was a great diplomat. Uh -huh. He was uh, skilled in the art of communication of um, pleasing people, but also being quite firm in his resolve and quite unforgiving at times. Mm -hmm. In this particular image, um, he was adored by the milkmaids. He, he actually, as a boy, worked for his stepfather um, taking care of cows, and the girls who helped take care of the cows really adored him. And sometimes they would have a dance, and they all wanted to dance with him. So the way he resolved that was he turned himself into many so that they all had a partner. Oh, how so it's the completely kind of, charming. Uh, yes. So he was yes. very charming. Um, a, a diplomat. A diplomat. Absolutely. There you go. Absolutely. Yes. So there he is.
being diplomatic. Now, we, we, we're going to get back to cows. Okay. But, but not quite yet. Yes. Uh, so this one here, mm -hmm. this there's one is a large elephant yes. over my left shoulder here. That's right. This is Sri Ganesha. He is, the, um, he is somebody who's always seen as, as the first deity, the first one that you address. Um, he's uh, the remover of obstacles, which is very important for most people. Is that people. why you see it often in shops? Yes, absolutely. Indian he's, shops, obviously. Yes, that's right. Um, he represents innocence and wisdom. Oh. And here I have him holding a flower, which um, his, um, is his favorite flower. And um, he's holding it up for this image of a, a, of a woman who's partly part of the hill. She's now part of the earth. And uh, he's mourning his mother. He's mourning for his mother. He's very attached to his mother. And that's, he's always at her side. She's well, it always looks there like with she, him. He's in, she, he is in her lap. He's actually, yes. He, well, he's sitting on the ground, which is Mother Earth. So that is her lap, if you like. I see. And, uh, oh, it's very touching. Yes. I, you know, you see it, and you, but the story behind is very important. Yes. Yes, yes and... Um, and what is this flower? Is this a poppy? No. No, um, I've gone blank on the name. I, this is... It's um, when it comes to you. It, when it comes to me, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's a it's a beautiful flower, and I have some at home. Um, Anemone? No. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> never mind. Never mind. Uh, so we going we mm. we have a lot of this work, and and, and 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 a lot of it is always here at the Deerfield Arts Bank. It seems. Yes, it, I do. It I'm fits very into whatever yes <laughs> whatever theme we seem to have. You have a picture that goes into it. Yes. Um, how did we get to, let's see, I think the next thing, or well, the cow. Yes, okay. So or did you want to say something about this? this? Well, okay, this is an, this is, is this a cow also? This is a cow also, So yes. we're still in the cows, okay. Yes, okay. So, um, uh, well, you can, you can make a reference to a sacred cow, which of course is an idea that's um, prevalent in India, but it's also a, a term that's very well used in our culture as well. Um, Sometimes that has a slightly negative meaning, but in this situation, um, the cow I'm seeing as as a, something that is a representative of the relationship between man and nature. The cow and you know, there's a woman again. And there's a woman here. This is um, this is um, Arada, who is often associated with Sri Krishna. She is um, also one of the um, ladies who takes care of the cows, but she's also a dancer. And she's very gently touching the cow, who is um, decorated in the Indian style. And this I did uh, when I first arrived in India. I was taken by taxi to the academy where I was going to study um, Indian miniature painting. And um, the taxi was, was driven by um, a charming young gentleman who obviously was into um, the benefits of the modern age. And we were driving in, the, in a rural area of India where people were still using ox carts. And he was beeping his horn at an ox cart that was in front of us so he could get round it. Um, and these beautiful animals were pulling this cart and this um, farmer was sitting there. And he helped his, his oxen go to the side of the road um, and then he touched the rump of one of, the, of one of them as we drove by. And I turned around to look and watch. And I was just so moved by that moment of his mm -hmm. relationship with that animal. And so I, this is how I included that. It's very that. touching stories. I want to go back to the mediums that you use. This one with the, with the goring of the, of the buffalo, buffalo mm -hmm. is in acrylic. No, that one's in gouache. In gouache, sorry. And what is, what is this one? And this the, one looks this like one, watercolor? This is watercolor. This and one was um, tempera. Huh, um, tempera. And this is acrylic. And this is acrylic? Yes, on, on cotton. On cotton. Yeah, so it's very thin. And um, it's beaded as well, so it had, has beads at the bottom. Um, so they're, they're like sort of decorative wall hangings, but they're also painted with these images. 
So I have several of these. And what I like about them is it gets back to my early description of how I like to use soft. fabric. Soft. It's not hard edged. Right. It has that. So you move from this soft medium yes. to something extremely intangible, mm. no brushes, That's right. and hard edged. And you break down the hard edges, don't you? Yes, I do. So now we've got these, here's another cow. Yes in a field mm -hmm. and you've told me that this is these are two images this is a double exposure done on my computer on a very simple program um, I first learned to do double exposures in a camera um, which was an amazing experience and I had hoped that I would somehow be able to afford to buy a camera I was doing this in a project which wasn't so it wasn't my camera um, but I was hoping that I would get a camera at some point, but I n could never afford a camera that would do this. But I found that there was a program where I could combine images, and it's fairly spontaneous. Um, so I had an image, um, these were both taken in England, of a field, um, actually walking through trees towards a field. And then I had another image of a cow standing by some barbed wire. And I combined them with this program. And I call this lost in the woods, because when you first look at it, it looks quite abstract. And it's only when you know it's a cow that you see it as a cow. And a lot of people said they can't see it. So right. this is, this is so also this is a double. Same yes, technique. this is the same technique. What, what, what are we? What so are here we looking? We're, we're looking at um, a lotus from a lotus pond in Amherst, which is very beautiful to see in August. I took a picture of that. And when I was in England some years ago, I went and I went on the London Eye, which is a huge Ferris wheel on the Thames, and took some photographs. And this is, the, this, is this huge wheel. It's called the London Eye. And so I combined those two, and I call it the Lotus Wheel. Um, and it's sort of playing around with the idea of nature and technology and how they are in some ways in opposition to one another, but yet uh, more and more we're having to combine them. But nature, in my, in my terms, is, is and they're both beautiful in their own way, too. You know, the, the things that man can create. Um, they're images that are, that are stunning. But somehow nature creates itself. We don't have that responsibility to make, we can't make a lotus. We can't create no. nature. You know, so I'm playing around with that. What did you do over, over with the... Um the one you call Amsterdam over okay, there. Okay, so that's... A, that's w w I want to say that this one here, I immediately knew it was Amsterdam. Mm. And why is that? Well, I think the bicycles. Yes. I mean, you see heaps and heaps of bicycles when you yes. go through Amsterdam. And these little buildings in the back, but also you can see the canal going through yes. behind the bicycles. And um, the, there's something very... Well, I keep use that word iconic, you know, about these these bicycles and, and the canal and the canal and Amsterdam and those little buildings which you can just see. This is a window. double exposure also? This is, a, this is actually, um, you know, I'm actually beginning to forget quite how I did that one. Oh dear. <laughs> okay, we'll leave so, that yes. one alone. It's beautiful, <laughs> but whatever it, but it is. But it, it is, it, it, I did play with it. Yeah. All right, so now what are you doing now? So, um, I had, I went through a, a, a sort of a little struggle there for a, a a few months after my last um, Indian miniature painting, I was actually exploring some biblical themes from Genesis, and um, I started to feel that I was getting kind of rigid in what I what I was doing. Um, I also had took a trip to England and um, was visiting friends who I love dearly, but some of whom are very really not well, and I felt like I must do something while I'm in England that helps me deal with, you know, the, the discomfort of my being with or knowing that my friends are going through these difficulties. So not the exile? Not the exile. No. No, it wasn't that. No. So what I did was I booked myself onto a sketching course in the Pennines, which is an amazing area of, in northern England. If this, is an, if this is an illustration of the Pennines, it is amazing. Yes, it is a stunning area. Um, it's 250 miles long. It's the watershed for northern England. 
So hill, so the rivers go down one side and the other, depending on you know how it all works out, um, down to the sea, and um, there these hills are. It's a subarctic climate. So I was there in August, and I, some of the time I was so cold. Somebody lent me some fingerless gloves so I could actually draw, but I was just so cold there some of the time. But then other days it's very pleasant. What is uh, the medium you're using here? So this is acrylic. So I did all these sketches and so on in uh, in England, and I brought them back to the studio, and I've started to reinterpret them. Sometimes the the sketch was so minimal because it was so cold and my and it was raining. Are or you are, are you pe are sketching in pencil? Uh, no, I was, I, would, I was sketching with all kinds of materials. I would take out three different mediums each day. So it might be pastel or oil pastel or paint um, or pencil or, or pen and ink. Um, and sometimes I would even use stones to rub on the surface of the paper. So your, your sketches, I've and ske I put them yes. in, in quotes here, yes. air quotes, actually picked up all the color. They didn't pick up all the color, actually. They, they may have some indication of color. Right. And then I reinterpreted those when I came back. And it, it, I feel like I'm still there because I'm, re, you know, I'm well, still they're, painting. They're, they're, they're sublime. I, I'm doing, I have many more sketches to do. And I, you know, it's some, this is a beautiful area here. And I think eventually I will want to do some more landscapes in this area. But I do hope to, com to combine some of these techniques you know that's I don't want to lose the Indian miniature and the meanings that uh, some of those have for me but at the moment I just want to explore the landscapes um, and the colors dark and light uh, atmosphere uh, to experience that in my um, in my painting at the moment why do you call the landscapes landfall uh, I was looking for a wor one word that would sum up. And landscape is not one word? Landscape is, has too many associations um, and too many, um, maybe it's a little hackneyed, it's used so much. So I wanted to find a, a word that gave the feeling of what I had there, which was this falling away of land. You know, when you go up high on these hills, the land falls away from you. Mm. And it's it's like um, and and then when you look like a up, waterfall. yeah. And then when you look up, it's kind of like a wave that's going to come over you at some point. It's just oh. so powerful. Um, so uh, uh, I've this rarely came. heard someone describe so movingly the background to their pictures. Thank you to their work. I, I I'm, am. I'm I, very appreciative. I'm. I you know my emotional. Reality is, is important to me. So, well, this on a very different note. Oh yes, <laughs> you're, it sounds. It looks like you're back to where you began with the batik. This is this is actually a little play. I'm being playful. What I have is a lot of little pieces left from classes that I run because I sometimes do batik classes. Yes, I have a lot of little bits of batik. So, um, I what I do is I cut them up into different shapes and make little hangings, which actually, if you go to India, you see these little hangings in doorways uh, or up above doors, and um, they're not usually made like this. They're usually more traditional. But this one, but I've been playing around with different ideas. Sometimes I have longer feathers, um, and sometimes just little feathers. shapes. They're not feathers. They're fabric, they're by fabric, the way. They're fabric, yes. Thank you. They're little bits of batik cut and sewn into these kinds And glued. Of, um, these yes, so this is glued on. This is, uh, yeah, the textile. Yes. Uh, bonded, actually. Bonded. Bonded. Bonded, yes. Bonded. It, yes. <laughs> Which is the new direction for sewing. Is oh, bonding. dear. Is bonding. Uh-huh. Well, what <laughs> will happen to all those sewing machines? I know. I know. Well, I still love the sewing. I have my old Singer, which I use, which um, um, I inherited. And um, it's a beautiful machine. It was made in 1915. 1915. Rachel, thank you. Rachel Hankinson, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a, a real delight. This is Talking Art. I'm Jane Treger. I would like you to email me at the email below here on the screen if you have questions that you think I should be asking artists that I'm not asking, and if you have any comments whatsoever. And uh, I, will, I thank Rachel Hankinson, and I'll see you next time in Talking Art.